Before we start this week's show, I'd like to remind you that The Brazilian Report is funded by subscriptions and support from loyal readers. Besides subscribing to our website and getting exclusive daily content on Brazil and Latin America, you can also treat our staff to one to five cups of coffee a month. In return, you get exclusive benefits like special newsletters, behind-the-scenes content, as well as a shout-out here on our podcast. And today I want to thank our Buy Me A Coffee members, John Thomas III, Luis Hens, Erwin Menez, Orlando Black, Steve Knapp, Aaron Berger, James Coney, Kars Dresvik, Alasdair Townsend, Peter Abrahamson, Michael Fryer, Miller Renacido, Jim Ofadeju, David Dixon, Felipe Saito, José Rosi Stankovic, Gabriela Graf Innes, Emerging Market Muser, Jordan Ifta, Tonica Thompson, Anderson da Silva, Kat Kramer, Fra, Peter Suffering, and Aland, and someone who chose to remain anonymous. And if you are like them and believe in the importance of independent journalism, and also if you want to hear your name on our podcast, just head over to buymeacoffee.com slash Brazilian Report and subscribe to one of the membership tiers. If you cannot make a monthly commitment, you can still tip us a cup of coffee every now and then to give us the energy boost we need to cover a country as complex as Brazil and a region as complex as Latin America, and we appreciate all support you can give us. Click on buymeacoffee.com slash Brazilian Report to find out more. Last week, February the 10th, Brazilian President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva visited his U.S. counterpart Joe Biden. The meeting laid bare the points on which the two leaders share common goals, such as the environment and the fight against the far right. I can reassure you, Mr. President, that the U.S. and the rest of the world could count on Brazil. Na luta pela democracia. In the fight for democracy. Na luta pela preservação ambiental. And the fight for the preservation of the Amazon rainforest. And also those on which they disagree, namely China and the war in Ukraine. This week we talk about what to make of the first meeting between the leaders of the two biggest democracies in the Americas. My name is Gustavo Ribeiro. I'm the editor in chief of the Brazilian Report. And this is Explaining Brazil. Mr. President, I'd like to say one more thing. It's necessary that we establish a new kind of conversation so that we can build a world governance that would be more strong. This week's episode is part of the Brazil 100 Project, a partnership between the Brazilian Report and the Wilson Center's Brazil Institute, aimed at discussing the main challenges the Lula administration will face and its moves in the first 100 days. And I'm glad to welcome Bruna Santos, director of the Brazil Institute. Bruna, welcome to the show and thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So, Bruna, Lula went to the U.S. and took with him Racial Equality Minister Aniele Franco and Environment Minister Marina Silva. Several meetings took place, and I know you were present in some of them. Can you tell us a little bit about how Lula's visit affected life in Washington or didn't affect life in Washington? I mean, we always talk about Lula's diplomatic clout, How was the anticipation for the visit and then the reception of the new president, who is also an old acquaintance, as he is also the old president? Well, I think, honestly, Brazil, uh, since uh, the election, is getting a lot of attention here. I don't think that this attention will last much longer, but I do believe that a number of people who are following Brazil, not only Brazilians in, in the U.S., but people who are interested in Brazil, who are uh, following uh, the events in Latin America, who are interested in understanding uh, 
uh, how Lula and Biden are going to cooperate or not in the future in different agendas, especially climate change. They were all like tuned in in understanding uh, what would be the results coming out of this visit. So I think here was literally like everyone looking at. And to be honest, I think that uh, Marina Silva was also expected. I was I wasn't sure till um, one week before Lula confirmed Lula's team confirmed the delegation coming. I wasn't sure if she was going to come, but I was really happy that she did. She I think I think the other ministers that came with Lula uh, were pretty much uh, focused on supporting the president's agenda. And Marina, on the other hand, I think she she had. Uh, a little more spotlight than the others. Uh, Marina, as you said, uh, she ha- uh, had a meeting with a number of different uh, philanthropists and funds. The Brazil Institute was the only think tank present, but uh, other organizations in the private sector, um, philanthropists like the Earth Fund uh, from Bezos, uh, and also the so-called Leonardo DiCaprio, Leonardo DiCaprio's fund, um, and other philanthropists and multilateral organizations were present discussing with Marina literally how, how can we help? Like, how can, what can I do to help you uh, achieve the goals that were, you were so committed to achieve? And um, it was really clear to me that uh, the announcement of uh, the U.S. joining the Amazon Fund is something um, that will catalyze other uh, institutions and, and countries to join the fund. And the symbolism of it, I think, was, was very important. As you know, the meeting was supposed to last 45 minutes between Lula and Biden, but it, in the end, it lasted like two hours. Um, it was, it was, it was a very successful meeting, I would say. I would say we had like was very short. Of course, we all know the schedule was lean. We had Lula in the U.S. for a little more than 24 hours. He arrived in the afternoon the day before and left on Saturday morning. And it was a very successful, uh, a very successful visit. You mentioned that Lula and Biden stayed together for much longer than anticipated. Is that a good omen in terms of Brazil-U.S. relations, considering that Relations between the two countries over the past few decades have been predicated on personal relationships between the the two countries' leaders. Well, I think in this in the case of Biden and Lula, we have two presidents that are very strong in presidential diplomacy. They are presidential diplomacy. And you mentioned like the presence of Lula, how how impactful it is anywhere. So um, I think that's a new era because of that, too, because I think both presidents are very committed uh, with two agendas, at least, that they have in common. One is defending democracy. The other one is uh, their uh, shared environmental commitments and their willingness to play an important role and uh, have uh, like been reminded by people with a legacy of protecting the Amazon and overturning uh, damage that were made in the past years. So I think in that case, it's important. The other one, I think, is, um, well, both are, uh, Lula's, Lula's visit comes on like one month after the events on January 8th. So I think that every time they were talking to each other during the meeting, you could see Biden reacting to Lula's uh, uh Mention anything that he mentioned, he would say, "Yeah, oh, I, I agree," or "I've seen that," or he would react to it. It's not common to see Biden doing that in 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 a presidential meeting. I think that his energy, even like when he was like receiving Lula in the lawn of the um, of the White House and uh, on his like sunglasses and in a very good mood, I think it represented like how oh, how good friends they are, like how they are uh, actually. Um, very well aligned since the, the the election, and even before. I remember when when Biden in went to Brazil in preparation for Dilma's visit when he was vice president. 
in the U.S. He went personally there and he made like a, a good reach out on, on media back then. He's very uh, like enthusiastic about Lula, about Brazil. And I think it says a lot about their personality. And I, as you said, like uh, this new phase opens a new uh, like an open uh, a line between Lula and Biden, a direct line between them that didn't happen uh, in the past. We didn't see it happening in the past between Bolsonaro and Biden. And uh, so I think that's very important. And um, well, we were, of course, uh, as like as Brazilians and people observing the public sphere in Brazil, we are always looking at like, what are the major announcements coming out of it, of this meeting? But I think that the symbolism of it was was actually like the, the best announcement coming out. And uh, was like, there, there is like a number, uh, a visit coming in late February. John Kerry is going to Brazil in late February. There are a number of other like bilateral visit, visits happening both from um, officials in the executive branch in the U.S. going to Brazil and Congress. So there are like a number of good uh, things in preparation for that. So, yeah, I think they have an open report between them now, and that's really good. Before getting into the specifics about the exchanges between Lula and Biden, I'd like to talk about diplomacy because you mentioned that these two men are great in presidential diplomacy, but their meeting also happened as both countries are changing their, let's say, institutional diplomatic representation. The U.S. has a new ambassador in Brasilia, Elizabeth Bagley, a longtime Democratic Party fundraiser, and Brazil named Maria Luisa Viotti a career diplomat to head the embassy in Washington, although her name still needs Senate confirmation. Uh, Brazil will also have a new consul in New York in Adonio Sena Gannon, another career diplomat. What do these nominations mean for how diplomacy between these two countries will be done in traditional channels? Well, first of all, I think it's a very good thing that we have uh, for the first time women like sitting in this and negotiating on behalf of both countries. I think also both of them have uh, important trajectories in uh, multilateral organizations. And uh, even though Bagley is not, uh, is, comes from the private sector, but she has been like, has played important roles in high level dialogues as well as Viotti who also is very well respected in the multilateral environment. And all of them have like important footprints to, to show. I think that, as you said, the traditional diplomatic institutionalized uh, relationship between the U.S. and Brazil, um, in between the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Brazil and the U.S., has always been um, something that it's been well structured despite the, the the presence of like noise in the narratives from both pre from presidents from both countries so i think that brazil us is we're having like next year it's going to be 200 years anniversary of diplomatic relations between brazil and the us so it's a re it's reasonable to say it's a well established environment for um for uh through the official lines, the institutional lines of, of uh, like relation, the relationship, also also the role of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and so on. So all those institutions around the the bilateral relations, I think they are well established. I think that those nominations represent, as I said, a new generation of Brazil-U.S. relations. Uh, I would, I would also add on the top of that that um, worth mentioning that Brazil. Uh, Bagley was present in, in the meeting, but the former ambassador to the U.S. Um, was not present, Nestor Foster. He was on vacation, has been on a vacation and uh, comes back by the end of next week um, as, we, as we wait for a transition for a new uh, ambassador here in the U.S. I see that as a good, uh, a good symbol. Good, um, It represents that it's getting like uh, the importance, the need, the importance is uh, the priority given to the U.S. within Brazil uh, foreign policy, are represented in the, quali the qualification of the nominations that we got. 
Now, Joe Biden's supposed focus on the green economy matches Lula's own promised priorities, but it appears that both countries have a more immediate priority in the defense of democracy against far-right threats. Biden faced the storming of the Capitol on January the 6th, 2021, just before he took office, and Lula has just faced the January 8th riots just a week after he took office. So both Lula and Biden have seen up close the dangers of political radicalization. Can you expect any concrete actions in this regard? I think that the upcoming uh, uh, Summit for Democracy is uh, going to be, it's going to give us a better signal on what's what's next in terms of uh, cooperation in that front. Um, on how they are going to respond that both countries are investigating the events. And uh, if there, there there is or not like judicial cooperation, it's yet to be seen, but there might be. Also, uh, I think both countries are also looking at how our regulatory environment towards social media, towards uh, platforms is somehow related to the spreading of fake news who are tied to the events on January 8th. So those are uh, elements that I think we should follow closely. But um, the role of those like fake news, um, informal and sometimes uh, very well-organized and traceable networks of fake news, the relationship uh, between um, Brazil and U.S. and maybe... um, people that were behind the events in in Brazil and that might be behind the events in the U.S. are also things that are under investigation. I think it may unfold. um, The investigations are unfolding, so we may uh, see something coming out of it. But in a broader level, as like important, the two biggest democracies in the region, uh, the presence of Lula in the Summit of Democracy created by President Biden, I think it will uh, bring us attention to what is the the role that Lula is going to play in the region, in the continent, especially the relationship in the relationship with other uh, countries such as Venezuela, Nicaragua. How wh- what is the role that Brazil is going to is going to is going to have on that in defending democracy, in defending uh, democratic institutions, and in um, defending also um, the, some things that f- are very important for Lula, for example, which is the the fact that Brazil needs to play um, somehow a moderate or a role in those conversations in the region. That's the way that Lula has been um, positioning Brazil, and that's uh, how the pattern in Brazil's foreign policy has been, like always uh, in, in, a, in a row of, a neutrality by strategy on certain matters. So in that front, I think that's uh, what we are gonna we are gonna be seeing. Now you mentioned Venezuela, and I want to go back to that subject. But first, I want to ask you about something you talked about, something that unites Lula and Biden, which is a push for social media regulations. In a recent interview, Lula spoke of the possibility of proposing a global regulation or at least a global governance around social media and against fake news. And he said he would take a proposal in that regard to the G20. Now, do you believe that this is something that is even possible to do? Because, I mean, regulating the internet at any level is already extremely hard, let alone something global, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. What... what I don't know, he might be talking about, I can't uh, speak for him, of course, but I think he might be talking about like some some level of like coordinating or um, harmonization of uh, regulations um, on that matter. That's what perhaps what he's, he's talking about. There are groups that do that. Like there is a group under the World Economic Forum that did that for a number of uh a number of uh, regulations. It's called um, Agile Regulation uh, Group, but I don't think that's uh, something that we'll find perhaps the 
the best uh, forum in the G20 because of the presence of two big internets there that are regulated in completely different ways, which is the US and China. So I don't think that uh, that might uh, be the best forum for that. However, Brazil has, the like in the past, been present in uh, discussions, important discussions on um, digital law. So there might, that might be something that Lula is seen as something for to Brazil to, to have the protagonist. I know that Celso Mourinho is someone who is an enthusiast of Brazil having a, a, a role on like redefining uh, the, the 21st century, 21st century uh, digital governance. But honestly, I think that Lula has uh, more work to do in um, organizing the house, the, his own like yard when it comes to how this discussion is being um, held in Brazil across uh, the executive and, of course, the judiciary. And um, this is something I believe we should, uh, this is the type of discussion that should be internationalized and we should like elevate the conversation as we move forward. Because, of course, it's not just a, a matter of like copying and paste other countries' regulation. There is no like one one size fits all, but uh, we are all like looking at the same uh, monster, I would say, which is all the implications that um, we saw happening in, in during the election. Brazil has like experience dealing with that in, in the court also dealing with that during Brazil's election that might be of interest to share those experience with the U.S. in the upcoming elections. But I don't believe that's something that we have now a mature understanding within Brazil to propose such a thing in any international forum. Now, in terms of the environment, Biden pledged U.S. support to the Amazon Fund, which is financed by developed countries to support sustainable development initiatives in the rainforest. But no amount was disclosed in the communique issued by Brazilian diplomacy. And then the local press here talked about $50 million, which, I mean, it's very underwhelming. What do you make of this? Yeah. I mean, we, ha we have a billion dollar problem. There's no way it's going to be like, uh, um, it's not a million dollar one. So we have to, the goal is to achieve deforestation, the end, to, to achieve zero deforestation in 10 years. You're not going to do that in uh, playing the million dollars game. But uh, as I said before, I think U.S. donation to the Amazon fund has one might be a catalyzer to uh, others to uh, shifts uh, the way that the U.S. traditionally supported Brazil in, in, in this matter because it um, it gives the resources to Brazilian governance, and that's something that it's it's important, and that's something was present in Marina Silva statement uh, here in in the U.S. And I think it is the gesture. I think that this the it was quite positive, but also relies on the negotiation um, capacity of Biden with the U.S. Uh, Congress. Right, but that donation still needs a green light from the U.S. Congress. Should we expect pushback from Republicans? Because, I mean, just take a look at what Senator Ted Cruz of Texas tweeted. He said, Lula is a, quote, unrepentant Chavista. Yeah, that's the, that's a risk. And that's something I'm, I, I believe that perhaps... Um, could be better uh, coordinated, of course. I think we ha we saw in the past that uh, Biden has requested um, much more. Uh, he received last year, in the last fiscal year, a billion uh, dollars for international climate finance. But he has requested for much more than that, more than uh, 10 billion. So... Um, he back then uh, was a number of people criticized how he negotiated for that. 
Uh, I don't think um, that's my position to to criticize because I haven't um, I haven't like investigated that much what was on his plate back then. But uh, I, yeah, I do believe that it might be um, a constraint in the future for this uh, bilateral relationship. This dynamic with uh, the U.S. Um, president and Congress, especially when comes it comes to uh, international aid and in this specific case, international climate finance is something that we should pay more attention to. Speaking of Brazil's stakeholders, not only Brazil's government, but also um, private sector looking at the bills that are sitting in Congress that may or may not have important effects on uh, creating this, what I call bilateral infrastructure to... um, to actually enable the U.S. to direct uh, financial and non-financial um, help to to Brazil on this matter, to the region, I'd say, to the Amazon Basin, right? So uh, I, I'm sure there are a number of like analysts, like organizations like the Brazil Institute, the President Report. Uh, I think you guys do like an excellent work in interpreting that, but there is like much more like layers of complexity in this relationship that it takes more than a pledge from Biden uh, in on this matter. Um, but I'm, as I said, I think it's quite positive. I think it's a gesture of something that is uh, being, um, we are rebuilding the bilateral relationship between the two countries on this matter specifically. And um I think there is, um, it, it's yet to be seen how um, Biden is going to negotiate with Congress on this matter. But you just pointed out to an important, um, an important, bo- an important like bottleneck to to this strategy on how successful it will be or not. You you remember Biden on his when he was campaigning, he pledged to raise uh, to raise and to mobilize twenty billion to save the Amazon. So he has now pledged 50 million. So he has a long way to go. Now, speaking of being an unrepentant Chavista and coming back to the matter of Venezuela, can Lula play a role in a rapprochement between the U.S. and Venezuela? Because there has been some reaching out from both sides as of late. Well, I see, well, Brazil has played... um, like a moderator role on this matter in the past. And that's the role I expect Brazil to play. I expect that uh, the like how Brazil is going to be present in the Summit for Democracy is going to be a signal for that. I think the fact that uh, Lula has been very clear on where he stands in terms of defending democracy in the region, even though in, in certain moments he opts for like, so what I call the neutrality by strategy, um, I think it, it, it demonstrates that this is an agenda that he want to be, he wants to be his legacy as someone who defended democracy in the region in a moment where it was threatened. And uh, I think he's not going to be leaning towards uh, more um, like aggressive or uh, I'd say bold statements about um, the current uh, situation in Venezuela. But I think we will will play a a role, like a more moderating uh, role on this. Um, Yes, when it comes to uh, like G20, uh, the role uh, of, um, of course, I think that Brazil can't afford to take sides on any dispute between Brazil, between the US and China. I don't see it. It happening. I see that Lula values, of course, and he's going to China in the next couple of weeks. Um, it's expected. I think his trip is expected to happen uh, very soon. It is a good sign that he came to the U.S. before that. And I don't see that this uh, governance uh, like discussion is getting in the way of uh, this relationship either. Um there is, of course, like nuances, and sometimes I have to be honest. Sometimes I feel a little uh, apprehensive on how certain statements from Lula is gonna are gonna come out, and how the the international community are gonna are going to look at it. 
when it comes to, for example, the, the relationship with uh, Russia and Ukraine and the fact that Lula has never like said uh, explicitly that uh, Russia was responsible for the, the, the invasion and uses the expressions like it takes two for tango. Yeah, no, and to your point, Lula told Time magazine that Volodymyr Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, was as much to blame for the war as Vladimir Putin. As Putin, which is the same position that Bolsonaro had, right? This Bolsonaro was also someone who didn't blame like Russia for anything. So that's the but the difference is I think that Lula has this has chosen this neutrality, um, like based on different um, premises than Bolsonaro. But is it still something um, we should? It's it it concerns everyone in here. But I don't think it's something that we should ex- even like expect from Brazil to take a, a different uh, path or position towards Russia. It's I don't see it happening. Um, and I think that Brazil is like just falling into like the historical pattern of Brazil's foreign policy on this matter, which is um, like made clear that Brazil has no interest in take sides on a dispute between the U.S. and Russia or China. Yeah, no, and to your point, Bolsonaro was heavily criticized for taking sides in U.S.-China tensions. <laughs> now, Bruno, finally, I want to turn to trade. Brazil's tariffs on a trade wave basis remain the highest among G20 economies after Argentina. During the Bolsonaro government, some of these tariffs on products such as ethanol, cotton, and corn were temporarily reduced in favor of the post-pandemic recovery. But a permanent measure would go against the rules of the Mercosur trade bloc, that a trade alliance Brazil shares with Argentina, Paraguay, and Uruguay. And the U.S. has been moving away from embracing free trade in recent years. Nevertheless, the Biden administration has been urging Brazil to lower trade barriers for U.S. exporters. To what extent this could be a source of tension in the agenda between these two countries alongside Brazil-China relations? One thing, I, uh, as I think that the U.S. has a, has a strategy that um, it's important for Brazil to pay attention to, which is the whole strategy on near shoring and French shoring. And I think that the bilateral trade has been like on the rise for quite a while now between both countries. Um, it rose by more than 25% last year. And uh, I believe that uh, this is something that the, the private sector has, of course, a lot of, uh, a lot to pressure uh, and has been doing like uh, work on guaranteeing that uh, the U.S., um, investment, which rep- has, represents also a good share of uh, Brazil foreign direct investment, which is like at roughly 25%, I think. And um, so this, the, as I said before, I think that the, the trade uh, relations between Brazil and the U.S. are extremely important uh, and well, important and well uh, institutionalized, despite the political environment. The there are of course matters that are uh, more um, I'd say sensitive when it comes to geopolitics, especially when you are looking at energy, uh, critical minerals, and so on. But those things I think will be um, will be treated separately and will be part of what I I I think should be a broader strategy coming out of Lula's government in terms of how Brazil is going to is going to lever or not the opportunity of uh of like being uh an important trade partner in uh, attracting investments to Brazil taking the opportunity of all this uh inflation reduction act that Biden has um so I think there are tensions that might emerge from certain uh, matters on, especially those that I just mentioned. But there are like work being done in terms of uh, also bilateral agreements and also um, what, you, what we talked about before, which is regulatory harmonization in other, other fields. Luna, thank you very much. 
Thank you so much. Bruna Santos is the director of the Wilson Center's Brazil Institute. And the Brazil Institute is the only country-specific policy institution focused on Brazil in Washington. It works to foster understanding of Brazil's complex reality and to support more consequential relations between Brazilian and U.S. institutions in all sectors. If you like Explaining Brazil, please give us a five-star rating wherever you get your podcasts. It takes only a second and that helps us reach a broader audience. Or better yet, you can sign up for the Brazilian Report, the journalistic engine behind this podcast. We have a subscription-based business model and your memberships fuel our journalism and keep us going and growing. Thanks to our subscribers, we have been able to cover Brazil and Latin America extensively. And for our work, we have won and been shortlisted for multiple international journalism awards. In order to keep doing that work, we need your support. Go to brazilian.report slash subscribe. I'm Gustavo Ribeiro. Thanks for listening. And Explaining Brazil will be back in two weeks because we're taking a carnival break. See you then. Música